Happy holidays. Happy New Year, everyone. Today, we are taking a look back at some of the most compelling conversations we've had surrounding the case against Rex Hewerman, the man accused of being the Long Island serial killer. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. Featuring author, psychologist, and daily contributor, Siobhan Scott. New claims against Rex Hewerman. This from the defense attorney, John Ray, of uh, some of the victims, uh, Gilgo Beach victims, tying Rex Hewerman to sex parties, to swingers, and also possibly tying Asa Elrip to some knowledge, at least of Rex engaging in, I guess, unethical or un not regular sexual behavior, uncommon sexual behavior. Yeah, between I, I'll a use the word again. Creepy is creepy. my word I of the week again. The... I think most of us respond <laughs> to that way. I... Yeah, Nothing against the polyamorous out in the world, but Rex just has a very creepy quality. Without a doubt, it goes beyond non-traditional, uh, I would say. With these allegations being made, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily make someone a murderer, but the fact that he is insanely recognizable, he's not the average, you know, five foot seven Joe that maybe no one would even remember having sex with in 1996. If you're part of that community, Rex, I think, would stand out in someone's mind and some of the individuals who have given some testimony and statements to John Ray are claiming that. Yeah, he was there, and even some of his victims, they had seen him with them while they were alive, and that he was very much involved in that sort of scene. What do these new allegations mean for tying Rex to, to these sort of crimes? Certainly, it puts him in the circle of this swinger sex community. Does that then tie him closer to these potential, his name, to these murders? I sure think so. And the other thing with this coming out, it may encourage other people who were involved in that scene back in the day and had contact with him that was strange, yeah. you know, scary, violent, unusual. Mm -hmm. More people may be coming forward. And so in that case, it's a good thing that people are coming out and talking about it. Let's talk about memory, because we're talking about going all the way back to 1996. Memories are flawed. Oftentimes, witness eyewitness testimony is not the most accurate. Our brains literally need to reconstruct these things every time they, they come out of our mouths. Uh, how does that play a factor in any of this? And could that be an argument as to the accuracy of, of some of these experiences that have been recounted in fairly great detail by some of these witnesses, maybe even more detail than... I guess one would expect to to have going back to 96. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just made, uh, you know, the defense argument right mm -hmm. there, you know, memory can be fallible, but the key is that he, just as you said, he's a very distinctive appearing person. And uh, as much as memory is reconstructed and is fallible, there are things that are pretty accurate that, you know, I can remember little things going back to a child childhood mm -hmm. and we've done research with kids that sometimes memories are encoded before they're even verbal. And, you know, these things can replay in their mind and stay salient in their lives. So it's one of those things that you have to weigh all the evidence. And if you had lots of people or a number of people coming forward with memories about things that happened with him in the past, I it's got to be weighed and looked at. And, you know, is there other corroborating evidence? I think the more that we get in this case, the more it seems very significant. Mm -hmm. And the latest stories just add to it. One of those memories that has been brought up by one of the witnesses uh, is a conversation that was uh, she alleges she had with uh, Asa Elrup uh, in the upstairs of their home as uh, she alleges Rex went downstairs and had sex with her boyfriend. That's a new piece of the puzzle of yeah. showing that he possibly was bisexual also could connect the male victim that has been right. found on the beach as well when you really look at right. it that way. But those those allegations of that conversation and what was allegedly said by Asa also paint an interesting picture about Rex Hewerman. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, but it was to the effect of, you know, Rex has given me everything, brought me from my country, 
but I'm still very afraid of him. She does not say that Acer Asa had any desire to participate in what Rex was doing with the sex parties, but was in fact there and would in fact also have knowledge of that sort of behavior uh, of her husband. What does that mean for her going forward in all of this? Uh, she's been an interesting character. So I'm looking at her as a, a victim of this and in certainly any way she possibly is, but at the same point, also has been very bizarre, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, in her behavior uh, of someone who is in her position. Does this point any more to to her psychology, how she thinks, how she operates? Because we're talking 1996. She's aware of him doing these things, you know, all these years ago. It's still yeah. with him all the way up to this day. What kind of relationship are we talking about? Yeah. And if this is true, it, particularly if he was having people over in the home and engaging in these activities, somebody said, well, while she was upstairs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is not a well woman. Mm -hmm. There are definite red flags for possible abuse and control in the relationship. And uh, I'm kind of surprised that, well, as far as we know, she's not being integrated into the analysis of the case, mm -hmm. you know, legally at this point. I mean, to what extent did she have awareness? Did she not? And I would love to see a psychological evaluation of her, which there's no reason that the court would order that or that would be done. But there are red flags everywhere that this lady is not well. Are we looking at this still? Because as far as we know, and I, I could be in not uh, right on this, it could be inaccurate, but as of the last thing I knew several weeks ago, she had not yet been interviewed by police. And, and that to me seemed insanely bizarre, but yeah. also is that, you know, is there a reason? Is that part of the strategy here? Is it part of this where we're waiting to see what else is going to fall out from the cracks? And if anything does in fact connect her to any of this and how she reacts to this sort of information coming out. Is that still part of the strategy here? Just keep that seeing would what be happens. A kind of an odd strategy. And I, I always found it very strange that they were not spending a tremendous amount of time interviewing her and trying to fill in the the puzzle pieces of this man and his life and the lifestyle. So, you know, that's another weird aspect to it. And have there been other interviews or things that we just don't know about because they're not sharing that with the public? But certainly everyone in the family will have relevant bits of information, whether they knew about his sexual behavior or not. I would think you would want to go over every possible source of information that you can, including neighbors, family members, you know, distant relatives. I mean, you want to build the case you want to find out every possible thing you can about this guy that is uh, the question and i wonder how much more we're going to continue to find out uh, about this guy there's still other states there's still a lot of evidence that needs to be combed through if anything this just seems to continue to push any idea of a trial further and further down the road with revelations like this. And these are coming from the the defense or the attorneys for some of the victims, not directly from official investigators yet. Uh, and that I think is an important to, to remember. How odd is that though, that information like this is coming through an attorney and not through official investigators. Is it more so just kind of the, the way that this case is stacked that maybe uh, some of these the victims, some of the, the sex workers, people who are involved in the sex parties, uh, just fear of going to law enforcement and saying, hey, I, I've been involved in this and not wanting to face reper repercussions for their own actions. And it's much easier to go to a defense attorney and have it presented that way. Yeah, it, it's again, it's another unusual aspect. The defense attorney is a very colorful character. <laughs> yes. And he's apparently from what I've seen, you know, in his presentations, he's comfortable in the spotlight and not averse at all to, you know, going out and talking about these things. Mm -hmm. He's created a scenario or a situation where he's open and seeking communication from other people who may be afraid to go to the police or uncomfortable going to the police. So it's another interesting thing. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's unusual and something we typically don't see. Without a doubt, more questions than answers, as always, with, uh, with this case. We'll continue watching. Want to listen ad-free? 
Want advanced access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.